Tonight we're pleased to welcome back Michael Heffernan from Lonsec and Roger Montgomery from Montgomery Investment. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. And Heff, before we get going, I noticed your face is a little bit shiny, so we probably need to put a bit of makeup on you. This has kindly left the back behind. Ah, uh, uh, yes, use it all the time at home. Let me tell you. But uh, well, let's just say another another day, uh, another day in the market, another day where turnover was uh, below four foot below four billion fourth day in the row the market's been wing wanging around in a narrow oh, range the Roger are you as uh, sanguine of the, as the hef is about the you know the, <laughs> the short-term global outlook we, we've um, we've just completed some statistical analysis of where our intrinsic values are in aggregate compared to where they've been uh, and since 2009 this is about as expensive as stocks have been so after that rally that we saw at the end of the GFC this is as expensive as they've got um, so, and we're finding an absence of value at the moment. We're not finding any new things to buy that are high quality and cheap. So that would tell us normally that the market's expensive. And what happens after that, don't know. But when we go back further before the GFC, so 2000, and, 2000 to 2007, the market appears to be reasonably priced. It doesn't appear to be too expensive. So it's tough. You know, we're 65% we're, we're invested in the private fund. We're 85% invested in the Montgomery fund. Um, and uh, and we, we can't find any new things to buy. So at the moment, we're just holding on to those positions. All right, well, let's see if we can provide some sage advice to our callers tonight. And uh, Paul is our first caller from New South Wales. Welcome to the program, Paul. Yes, good evening, Kim. Thanks for taking my call. I've just got a question on Maxi Trans, or Maxi Trans Industries, uh, code MXI. I bought it when it was down around 52 cents, and it went to a high of a dollar eight about a month ago, and now it's sort of falling back and trading between that dollar and ninety cent range. Is it? Uh, I just guess I wanted to get some advice. If you guys, is it time to to take the money and run, or um, I'll keep holding yeah, on? Back to trans. What do you think? I really think that the um, the 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 caller uh, was it Peter? Was it? Uh, no, it was Paul. 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 Sorry, Paul. Um, I think you you've done really well um, to make money out of this particular company simply because mm. it's it is a capital intensive business. It makes tip trailers, as you know, for um, for trucks. Um, and, uh, and if you have a look at its profit history, in 2003 it made $5.3 million profit, then in 2005, $12 million, and then $14 million in 2008, but then $4 million in 2009, $4 million in 2011, and $12 million last year. So it's not surprising that if you go back 10 years and look at the share price, you'll find it's, it's sort of range trades, and that's because that's the way the profit behaves. So my valuation on the company is about a dollar. It's trading, I think, about 94 cents or thereabouts. Um, so it's right on its intrinsic value, and you've done very, very well. Um, I wouldn't have bought it in the first place, so I'm not one to give advice on what you should do next. Uh, but it is at its intrinsic value, and historically, it hasn't really grown significantly in terms of its profits. All right, so good advice. And we've got an interesting one from Peter from Sydney, which is an email. And he's asking, why did the Hong Kong and Shanghai comp fall in trading today? Interesting, interesting, interesting oh, question. Actually, You've caught me on it. You've caught me there too because I didn't look at them. Did, uh, oh, hang on. Hong Kong was down. Oh, actually, regional markets today. Hong Kong looked like it was up 44 points. There you go. All right. Could that have been the day before? It could have been. Because no, that's no, the it's, opening bell sheet. The opening, uh, no, it's closing bell. Oh, is it? Closing bell. Oh, sheet. sorry, I can't so, see that. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, what did it fall by yesterday well, then? The, the, oh, can I'll make a couple of points. Yep. Um, the issue for uh, Hong Kong and um, the Chinese market is the exposure of the banks. Um, to the um, extension of credit terms by their customers to their own customers. So shipbuilders, uh, iron, iron man steel manufacturers, uh, manufacturers of concrete making equipment, manufacturers of road building equipment, what they've been doing for the last 12 months is selling on credit to their customers and they haven't been receiving repayment for that. So we've seen a blowout on their balance sheets of their uh, receivables and their day's debtors has blown out as well, tripled sometimes and in some situations or some cases quadrupled um, and that's going to flow back to the banks because what they've done is they've reported increases in revenue, they've reported increases in profits, but they're accrual profits and accrual revenues, not cash flow. And so banks have extended money to these companies. What they're going to find is they're not going to be paid back. And that's, that's been flowing through. And so if you have a look at the Australian market compared to the US, we haven't followed the US up. The US total return index is now at all time highs. We haven't followed that. And the reason why is because we're following Asia. And Asia, particularly China, is not going so well. I can't talk about today in particular, and I don't know why it's done what it's done today, and I don't think it matters that much. Um, but longer term, that's the issue for the, the Asian market. New South Wales on the line. Welcome to the program, Jeff. 
Oh, hi, Kim. Thanks very much for taking on the call. Uh, I'm interested in uh, two companies, please. One's Bradkin. I've had shares in them since they uh, floated, and they've been up and down, and they're trading at about... Uh, uh, 12 month lows and I was just wondering if the panel thought it might be an idea to grab a few more and the other company is Cobar Consolidated they've got a silver mine not far from our part of the world and I just was wondering uh, what the, com uh, the panel thought of them first. Roger any value in Bradkin at these prices and mining uh, services stocks? I we, mean, we, you know... we, we sold all of our mining services stocks and I can tell you the day the 4th of April um, and uh, 3rd and 4th of April and we sold them all uh, because our outlook for them was deteriorating, their intrinsic values were flattening out. They subsequently fell in some cases 40 or 60 percent. We think it's a, what's called a value trap to buy them now. Um, in the case of Bradkin you have to understand, it's really important Jeff to understand that these are um, these are high operating leverage businesses so when revenues coming in the door they can cover their costs and make a small return but the problem is they don't cover their cost of capital unless there's boom conditions in resources so historically in Australia these businesses have come out of nowhere and then gone bust uh, and Brad I'm not suggesting that's going to happen to Bradkin but when I look at it even though it's cheaper than its intrinsic value its debt's gone up so its balance sheet's deteriorated and it hasn't added any intrinsic value for the last seven years so it's not one for me. Um, okay we're going to take a quick break um, but before that it's time to start the stopwatch and Roger what are you watching your time starts now. Okay, well as I suggested earlier, in our view there isn't a lot of great quality companies that are cheap at the moment. However, one of the things that we're seeing, one of the themes that we're watching is the internet and we're calling it the internet everything. Basically everything is becoming connected to the internet and more and more devices are being connected to the internet. We've also got a trend uh, of movement from, for advertising for jobs away from newspapers to online and China of course is growing as well. Seek is my pick. Back to the program, we were talking about, or Roger more particularly was talking about Seek um, and what's going on in the internet. Interesting chart there, Roger. Um, you know, if you're getting into these internet stocks, there's obviously a lot of volatility associated with them. What sort of price do you reckon you'd be, you know, you'd be buying Seek at? Well, we own Seek, and uh, and we reckon it's valued at about this price, but that valuation is rising significantly. Um, they've got an interest in the a large interest in the second largest job site in China. If they spin that off and listed that on the NASDAQ in boom conditions, um, the, the market price that they could get in an IPO of their interest in that uh, second, tier, second number, or rather number two uh, job site, Chinese job site, could, could um, exceed the market capitalization of Seek totally. And it's not on the balance sheet at that level. It's obviously on the balance sheet at cost. Uh, and so, um, so we think it's worth considerably more than where it's trading. Um, and even if that doesn't happen, operationally their intrinsic value is rising at about 8 or 9% a year over the next three years. And they're trading at their intrinsic value today. We can't disagree with that. So if you, anyway, so if you've got a question you'd like um, answered, give us a call on 1300 30 34 35 or email us at Sky News. Now just to quickly come back to... Jeff's um, other stock, he was talking about COBA. Roger, anything to add? Yeah, look, they, um, they started off in 2007 uh, with about four, four, $5 million of equity that was injected. Um, they haven't made any money since then. They've since raised another $60 million. Now, they're forecast next year to make their first profit. And, you know, I've seen that before. We've all yeah. seen those forecasts. Uh, but they're forecast to go from a $4 million loss this year to a $17 million profit uh, next year and if that happens well their valuation is about 50 cents which is roughly where they're trading they're trading about 55 cents so that's what they're worth all right okay well let's move on to a much more interesting stock than that when steve from new south wales has got a question about qve fire away steve uh, good evening panel. Evening. My, my question is with regards to QBE. It's, um, all the press we read about QBE tells us that the, the company has $24 billion somewhere in America invested in um, a, a low percentage uh, dividend return. Treasuries. US Whatever they are. Yeah. Now, they're, they're supposed to have 1.1 billion shares on issue. If they've got $24 billion that they can get their hands on um, and they've only got 1.1 billion shares on issue, why is their stock price um, 10 bucks, 11 bucks? Good, good, good. So, good, um, good. What are your thoughts on QB at this point? Well, well in answer to Steve's question, the, the reason why, there's two reasons why it's trading where it's trading despite the treasuries that it's got. Steve, what you have to appreciate is those treasuries represent float. 
um, and, and what that means is there are claims, contingent claims against that money. So they've raised money in premiums, uh, so they've charged uh, uh, people who want to in, be insured a premium, they've received that premium, they've gone and invested that premium, it's called float, and they earn money on that, they're not earning very much at the moment, but they earn money on that, and, but they may have to pay those premiums out if a claim is made, if significant claims are made. So that's why it's discounted that way. Um, the other thing to remember is that there's $10 million of equity in this business. So if you had a bank account, 10 billion rather, if you had a bank account with $10 billion and it was earning, and, and you're running a business, you're trying to make 12, 15% on your money, but if you're only getting six, well arguably that business, that equity is worth less uh, than what you could, uh, what, it's, what it would be worth if you could invest it at 12 or 13 or 14 percent elsewhere, and so it should trade at a discount to that equity valuation. So I've got it valued. I've got uh, QBE trading at about its intrinsic value at the moment. Um, the problem has been that every analyst that I talk to that comes to visit us at the office, they tell us this is year one of a premium cycle uptick. So premiums go through cycles and their premiums are about to go up and I've been hearing that for about three years. Um, so what we've seen is QBE's intrinsic value declining since 2007 for the last five years. Um, all the hockey stick projections are that it's going to uh, tick up now and it's trading at about its intrinsic value. But hopefully that's an explanation for you. Okay, thanks for that Roger. Eric is the next caller on the, on the line. Welcome to the program Eric. Thanks, Kim. Just, uh, just, just before I start, um, it seems to be quite a joke about you know Germans have to be continually buying out the uh, Greeks. I mean, uh, as a percentage of GDP after World War One, uh, the reparations are exactly the percentage of the GDP that the Germans are paying out now. We saw what happened then: hyperinflation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, my question is on, on ARB Corporation, Roger. What, what's the intrinsic value, and uh, where do you see them going? Thank you. Okay, well we really like ARB, we, uh, we own the stock. Um, ARB uh, is uh, uh, just a terrific business, it's got 43 stores worldwide and it's the largest uh, distributor of bull bars in the world, they manufacture out of Thailand as you know. Um, this is a business that's run by Roger Brown, my only caveat is uh, that um, it's an A1 business so we regard it as one of the top quality companies listed on the Australian market, its intrinsic value has risen by, I can tell you this right away, its intrinsic value has risen by about 14% a year for the last decade and it's forecast to rise by about 11% according to Scaffold um, over the next three years but it is a little bit expensive compared to its current intrinsic value. It's still at a discount to its intrinsic value two years out, but expensive compared to its current intrinsic value. And Roger Brown won't be there forever. He's been running the business for 36 years, and at some point he'll step down. Hopefully the culture won't change. Our next um, yes. caller, which is, uh, which is an email from um, Eric. And uh, Eric's, uh, I'm sorry, from Danny. Danny's uh, writing to the panel and he's saying, could the panel advise what the opinion is on relation to, on, on our opinion in, on the relation to IFL? The firm is well managed and has completed a number of successful takeovers in the last few years, such as Australian Wealth Management, DKN and Plan B. It pays a dividend of about 6% fully frank. Further consolidation of the wealth management industry could take place over the next three years. And would the current share price of $6.19 be a good entry point? for a holding for the next three to five years? An interesting question. Roger, how does this uh, fit into your, into your model? Yeah, it's trading, uh, look, it's, it's, it's very expensive at the moment. Our intrinsic value is trading at about $6.22, but our intrinsic value for it uh, is, uh, let me just check, $3.34. So our intrinsic value is half of where it's trading. The issue that I've got for this business, it goes back quite a way, but They've managed to increase their profits significantly. So for, the, for 10, year, 10 years ago, in 2003, they were earning about $34 million. Um, they're forecast to increase that to $100 million next year. So let's say it's a tripling uh, of their profit. The problem is last year they only earned 29. So last year they earned less than they earned 10 years prior. Next year they're forecast to revert back to about 100. But here's the thing, in order to achieve that, They've, uh, they started out 10 years ago with $129 million of capital injected by owners. They've now got almost $900 million that people have tipped in. So of course your profits go up when you tip more money in. That'd be your mum. Uh, yeah, so you're late for dinner again. <laughs> I can see you on TV. Uh, you're yeah, on TV, yeah, right, Michael. Okay, if you don't, if you just <laughs> bear with me a moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's reminding uh, me of the time, actually. So, so the, you know, they had 49 Sorry, million that. shares on issue 10 years ago. They've now got 232 million shares. So, so you could do that with a bank account. You put more money in a bank account, you earn more interest, and that's why the share price today is roughly where it was a decade ago. Okay, you. Janine from Melbourne is our next caller. Welcome to the program. 
What question would you like to ask the panel? I'd like to ask the gentleman what, uh, about Sweetwood. I know that it does service, part of it does service the mining company and other caravans, and some analysts are still recommending it. Um, I'm just wondering what the panel thinks of it. And Adelaide Brighton, if they have time, please. Okay, a couple of interesting stocks there. That's uh, Fleetwood's popped up a couple of times, a couple of times here um, on, mm. on on the program. Um, seems to be, you know, a stock that's in um, just about on everyone's buy list at the moment because of um, you know the, the annuities that it's getting out of the uh, West Australian government running some of these um, some of these accommodation mm. centres in the in the Denver. northwest. Um, what are your thoughts on? Adelaide Brighton and do well, a quick wrap on well, there's two, Fleet, you know, Fleetwood, it's, it's, Fleetwood it's a, at the back if you want it. To. It's a tough one because um, you know, on, on the one hand you've got the view that uh, we're at the bottom of the cycle for building in Australia and, and you know, builders are doing it tough but that's what always happens at the bottom of the cycle, that's on the one hand and it's all going to get better with interest rate cuts. On the other hand you've got this idea that we're going to see massive capital outflows from Australia next year um, which is going to push us over the edge. You know, Our balance of payments deficit can't be sustained um, without capital inflows so capital outflows are going to be a major problem for us and we have to turn the brakes on the economy um, in order to fix that. Um, so the, so, so I, look I don't know the answer to that question. What I do know is Adelaide Brighton's intrinsic value has been going up pretty well uh, over the last six or seven years but it's expensive at the moment. Um, and that's why its share price today is about what it was in 2006, because it's been expensive for a long time. Any thoughts on uh, Fleetwood? Yeah, Fleetwood, look, we know Fleetwood well. We've owned yeah. it twice in the last 10 years. Uh, and, um, and the last time we bought it, and I'm quite proud of this particular trade, Kim, we bought it in the GFC at about $3.50, and I sold mine at $13. And the, the guys at the office like to rib me about it because they sold theirs at $14, <laughs> um, which was at the... <laughs> at the highs. Um, but here's an interesting statistic. If you look at the options that were issued to some of the management team over the last 10 years, what you'll find is they started off with about $400,000 worth of stock um, 10 years ago and that's grown to something like $40 million or $80 million worth of stock. Uh, and, um, and so a shareholder in the business couldn't have achieved the same returns as management. The share price would have been a lot higher if not for those option issues. That's my only bugbear with this particular company, otherwise I really like it. It's just expensive at the moment. All right, we'll move on to our next caller who's Jacinta from Brisbane. Welcome to the program, Jacinta. Oh, hi. How are you going? I'm good, thank um, you. I've just got a question around um, what your thoughts are around the future prospects of Nardo Petroleum. Nardo Petroleum. What, uh, what, what do you know about it, Jacinta? Because I know absolutely zip. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I've bought stocks in it, so <laughs> just want to get some opinions around what, if you know anything about it and what the future prospects oh, might yeah. be. Any ideas where it might be operating? Yeah, the Philippines. Philippines, um, okay. Uh, but it's, um, it is a specy, it's a yeah. speculative stock. Um, I haven't got an intrinsic value on it because I haven't got any forecast for it making a profit next year. Well, I'm sorry, I can't help. Next uh, caller is an email from Adam, and um, Adam is saying that he's a long time watcher and a first time emailer. And Cardno has been in a fall, free fall for the past couple of days after disappointing half-year earnings forecasts. Does, does the team think this is a, a good contrarian um, investment opportunity or a dangerous place to be? Um, the graphs in, in graphs, if we, if we do get a chance, Roger, how does this uh, stack up? The, the Cardno is a consulting engineer, so they're not a capital-intensive business. Mm. Um, but uh, the issue for them, and one of the things I can't seem to understand, is they just keep raising money and they keep they keep making acquisitions and they keep uh, raising fresh capital. So their profits have gone from $1.7 million about 10 years ago to $74 million last year. Um, but in order to achieve that, they've raised, they had $17 million of equity put in by shareholders 10 years ago. That's gone up to $460 million. So they've raised $450 million in the last decade to increase their profits from about $7 million in 2003 to $74 million uh, $74 million last year and they're increasing their debt. So when a company has a, a, a sort of a, a, a negative outlook statement and its debt's gone up uh, and it's grown through acquisition and capital raisings, um, it's not surprising that it's had such a big correction. It's still expensive even after the correction in the share price. Well, so far we've had, we haven't been able to find anything to buy. We've been able to bag plenty of stocks. I want to oh, I said right at the start. Uh, yeah, know, I, I couldn't know. find any high Exactly, exactly. But uh, this is a point I made earlier about you know, there's, there, there is there is obviously some pockets of value in the uh, in the mid cap. I think it's fair. I think that's. I think what Michael's saying is absolutely right. But, but you know, this time last year we were seeing lots of bargains. You know, we were seeing things that were absolutely cheap that looked really good value, 
and and now it's you know it's line ball you know is is it cheap is it not cheap it's too close to call for us yeah that's the issue yep no I have to agree there's uh, two schools of thought on that okay Simon's our next next caller welcome to the program Simon yeah thanks for taking my call um, with interest I've been, what I've been reading with interest rates coming down hopefully next year and uh, a lack of supply in the residential housing market. I've been looking through scaffold at a few uh, stocks that I might get into in the in the, that sector and I've looked at CSR, Borrell, James Hardy and Adelaide Brighton and I was just wondering, Roger and Hef, um, is there any stocks on their radar for the residential construction industry? Well, you know, good question. We we did touch on we've touched on Adelaide Adelaide Brighton. So, Roger, do you want to take first bite of that? Yeah. Look, uh, look, we've got a pretty simple rule when it comes to residential construction businesses, particularly the developers. You don't, you want to buy them at a discount to NTA, and when they get back up to NTA, uh, then you end up selling them. And and historically, that's been a very wise thing to do. Um, I read some research that said Brickworks looked pretty good because it was exposed to a, a turnaround in outer western Sydney properties and then some very large developments being conducted by developers like Landcom uh, out west. The only problem for us is there's not a lot of value in the sector you know, and Boral's intrinsic value has been declining for 10 years. Having said that, Boral's exposed to the United States which uh, many experts are now saying, even Warren Buffett who's got a lot of exposure to residential construction in the United States. Um, He's saying that, uh, that that oversupply, the overhang of properties, uh, no longer exists and that's being absorbed. And so we're going to see a recovery of housing uh, in the United States. So I, I can't disagree with that. I don't know any, any, other, any other view. Um, uh, in Australia, low interest rates will start to move people into the stock market, as we're seeing, and then it will move people into property as well. So you could be right. There could be a, a momentum uh, opportunity there, but I can't find a lot of value. Well, do you prefer James Hardy over Boral for that uh, for that exposure in the, in, in the States? Or no, I the... prefer Boral out of yeah. those two. Brad's our next caller from Sydney. Welcome to the program, Brad. Yeah, hi there. Um, look, I'm just uh, ringing up about a stock called Jumbo Interactive. Um, I'd like to check maybe if um, Roger could give me a valuation on that, um, J-I-N. Sure, we'll see what we can do. I think, Roger, you've been following this one. Yeah, we, we, we've owned it. We sold it admittedly too early. Uh, we sold it on news that Robbie Cook was leaving What If to join TATS uh, and TATS were going to reinvigorate their online, uh, their online uh, offering uh, and that would compete against Jumbo Interactive and we've seen some moves towards that. We'll be meeting with Robbie Cook when he joins TATS uh, that owns New South Wales Lotteries uh, and have a chat to them then. Uh, it's trading at about its intrinsic value. Intrinsic value is a little bit higher than where it is now. Uh, it's trading at uh, where is about $2.35 or thereabouts and we've got intrinsic value at $2.29. So uh, it's trading right on it. Um, uh, I do regret selling it too early, but you know the reality is that we've got a portfolio of stocks and we're still outperforming materially. We've probably given away half a percent in terms of performance by selling it too early. Is the blue sky in, in this stock the gambling license that they're trying to nail down? Yeah, look, in the they're, States? They're, they're, they're going for a, a license in the US. They're going for trying to go for several licenses. It will cost them a small bomb uh, for their marketing um, because once they get that license, they're going to have to they're going to have to grab market share, and that's going to cost a small fortune in terms of uh, in terms of capital outlay and working capital. They may have to raise money. Uh, to actually um, to actually fund that if they win enough licenses, um, but that would be a material uplift in their expectations, and you'd imagine that the price would go um, would would continue to rise exponentially if they won a license overseas. Um, our view is that um, our view is that their Australian businesses will soon be under threat from a from a reinvigorated competitor who used to be their partner, and that is uh, Tats. We can because we've got Jim from Victoria on the line. Welcome to the program, Jim. Hi, Kim. Thanks. A very entertaining night tonight, I've got to say. Um, well, we try, try and make everyone laugh at least once. <laughs> You're doing that, and my wife's even enjoying it. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Um, can I just have a fundamental analysis on Scaffold from Roger on Coca-Cola CCL? Interesting stock, the ultimate defensive stock to be in. Yeah, look, Everyone uh, says it's, it's too a expensive. business that changed its spot some years ago because it was a bottler. So uh, it had well, all the infrastructure. It now uh, makes beer too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Be a good but it had all the infrastructure. So Coca-Cola in the United States owned the brand and the, the recipe for the syrup. It sold the syrup uh, to, uh, to bottlers and the bottlers had all the infrastructure and all the maintenance. Uh, that's changed somewhat now uh, and, uh, and Coca-Cola's got terrific prospects and that's why the price has done so well over the last decade. Intrinsic value's risen but it is expensive now. So our intrinsic value on this is, uh, uh, well Scaffold's intrinsic value is $8.76, uh, rising next year to $9.51.
but you've got the share price at over $13 at the moment. So I'll just add moment. one extra point for Jim. Um, Jim, Coke is a company that's never in the last decade traded at a discount to its estimated intrinsic value. And so if it got down to around its intrinsic value, if it got within sort of 10, probably, 5, 10%, you probably, you probably, wouldn't, you want probably to, wouldn't want to buy it. <laughs> well, no, well, it's happened a couple of times that it's got close, but it's yeah. never got to a discount. So I, I'd be tempted to be buying it if it got close to those levels. Okay, we're going to run out of time, but look, just a quick comment, because um, there was an interesting thing on the wires this afternoon from David Baker, who runs $1.2 billion out of uh, London in, 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 in gold funds. He's talking about you know, gold breaking out above 1920 very, very soon. So just a quick wrap from both of you. What, uh, what, what are your views on the, on the, on, on the gold right, question? Well, I mean, you know. We own gold. We own yeah. Silver Lake Resources. Yep. And every year for Christmas I buy my wife some gold, some physical gold, um, uh, just because it's a nice thing to do. It uh, is a nice thing to do. Yeah, and, uh, and that's about it.